Hello, Betsy friends and family, and welcome back to our Ghost Light series. Today, I'm very excited to have as our interview guest, uh, the two-time winner and defending champion as America's most produced playwright, Lauren Gunderson. Everybody. Everybody needs a boxing ring announcement at least once in their life. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lauren. Um, a lot of you in, in Betsy land will uh, know Lauren's work. We produced three of her plays, Silent Sky and The Revolutionists and uh, Miss Bennett, Christmas at Pimbley. Um, so our, our, our Gunder play repertory is quite deep. She's a big favorite of ours and our audience. Uh, so hi, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Hope everybody is staying safe and sane out there. That's all we can do at the moment. <laughs> Uh, where are you and, and how are you riding out the storm currently? I am in San Francisco where I live with my family, two kids under six and one cat. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's wild. Of course, our city was the first to go on full shelter in place mode. So we've been at this for quite a while. Um, and yeah, it's, it is a strange new reality that makes me I don't know, engage and <clears throat> puzzle through the world in a different way. I'm sure all of us are having similar revelations and challenges and confrontations about, about how we live in this world. And <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, that you have two uh, little ones at home with you. Is this a new uh, reality for you as far as being an, an artist at home with two kids? I have a seven year old and uh, my reality as far as work has very much shifted on a day-to-day -day basis of being a part-time teacher and part-time dad and part-time theater operator. And uh, what's, what's your new reality like? Yeah, it is. I am not a preschool teacher, not a kindergarten <laughs> teacher. Um, so I'm grateful. We are staying in touch with teachers with Zoom classes and my kids have more Zoom meetings than, than I do these days. Um, yeah, it's it's difficult. I mean, luckily my kids are pretty small, so it's not like I have a junior in high school or a college student where the classes are very intense. We're still, you know, discussing our colors and our our letters. So <laughs> I, I can cover I can cover most of that. You, you got you got that knowledge base. You're good. Oh my gosh, yes. But it is it is um, you know the conversations around screen time. All of our rules about that are just shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It is. It is a, a wild, a wild world. But in some ways, I am grateful for the time with them. You know, most of the time, Ch check in with me hour by hour. How yep, it, can, it can change <laughs> quickly. Yes. But it is. It's. It is. Um, you know, most of the time they would be at school for eight hours of the day, and a lot of that time is with us here in some capacity. So, uh, yeah, it's, it has. It has know. been lovely, and it's been a, a good reminder to. Uh, of how much our sort of busy usual lives do take away from that family dynamic, you know, that, that you know, when, once they start school and, and it's, it's an hour in the morning and three or four hours after school and that's bedtime and that's your daily allotment, except yeah. for weekends, you know, and if you're in rehearsal or something like that, it's even less than that. And I think it, it, for me, it's been a, a great perspective reminder of, hey, having some more time with these people that I love is not a terrible thing. Um, yeah. And uh, some hours are worse than others, but. Yeah, I mean, I was having, I was traveling a lot for workshops and premieres and, and stuff like that. And of course that is settled down. <laughs> so <laughs> it is, uh, it's a lot of togetherness, which you yeah. know, in the, the long run isn't terrible as long as you don't, you know, throttle each other. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Because we have enough box macaroni and cheese, and then oh, you should well, you're, you're, you're set then. Me. <laughs> Excellent. You're you're good. Um, well, I want to actually go back to that. Uh, my my introduction of you there. You have been uh, twice in the last three years. You've been America's most produced playwright uh, outside of Shakespeare, but we don't count him. He's uh, a built-in advantage. <laughs> so. Um, What's that like? What does that feel like? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're a very prolific writer, but even so, uh, I'm sure that, you know, there, that wasn't a, a thing in your head when you were, you know, a young playwright and studying your craft and whatnot, that someday I'm going to be, what, is, what does it feel like to, to know that audiences and theaters everywhere love your work? Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's the dream I didn't know you got to, to dream for. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what, it, what it means to me is um, a kind of nationwide community. I mean, 
companies like yours, cities like yours, where it's not one play, it's not two, it's three. Um, it feels like I get to have a bit of a conversation and a, a long conversation with, with a place and a group of artists. Um, and that's, that's the whole point of it, really. Um, all of this storytelling is to kind of be in continuation with each other. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful and blown away every year <laughs> that, that I get on that list in any, in any place. Um, and it is truly exciting to see the other artists on that list, so many of whom are women, many are women of color. Um, we get to see that list change from a lot of white people and a lot of dudes to a lot more women and a lot more voices that represent different communities than have usually gotten the stage. So that's just thrilling. We're all doing something right. <laughs> we can continue to broaden the, the voices and amplify the voices that you don't often get to hear. So I'm in some ways happy to be one of them, although I'm also happy to pass the mic <laughs> to people who to people who don't um, get their stories told as much. And I think the gift of that is truly to realize how common our stories actually are, that as different as we may think we are, it is, um, we all care about our families, we all want love and respect, and we want um, time together. And, you know, it, it, the, the material stuff of plays is actually pretty, um, pretty shareable, <laughs> you know? The distinctions are incredibly important and what makes us different makes us stronger and the um, diversity is certainly the, the greatest thing in humanity, but a lot of the core um, confrontations and the causes of action of theater and you know what, what makes a great story is similar across humanity. So I, I, love, I love seeing that in those lists that I get to be on <laughs> and uh, yeah. It's uh, one of my one of my real hopes for this this moment and this crisis is that I really do feel like we are in the middle of this uh, incredible kind of golden age of American playwriting and there's been this you know real shift as you were saying in the the types of plays that are getting done the voices that are being heard and the people that are being amplified and I really really hope that this is not an interruption that that disrupts that to the point that it it, it stagnates the growth that was happening because it was so exciting to see. Yeah. everywhere and, and I hope we can pick up right where we left off and, and, and leap yeah. forward. What do you what do you think it is about your work particularly that connects with all these theaters and all these people? Um, you know you, you, you write a, a real diversity of different kinds of plays and, and different subjects. You have some things you return to like science and things like that but, but what do you think it is about your voice that speaks to people? I don't know. I should ask you that question. <laughs> You'll have to interview me some other time. <laughs> I actually get asked that a lot, and I go, I'm actually the wrong person to ask. Now, I can tell you why I wrote those plays, um, and the short answer is because it's the plays I want to see. It's the ones that I want to go to. I want stories. I love based on a true story stories because it makes me feel like the world of fiction is just holding hands with um, the world of fact and day-to-day -day life, and and period pieces make me feel like I'm time traveling and I want new heroes and to, to grasp onto. I want plays that make me feel hopeful at the end, but aren't so perfect that they feel ridiculous and impossible. Um, I want plays about women, not just a woman, <laughs> more, more than one. I more than one woman? More than one. <laughs> oh, shocking, I'm shocked. Um, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, so some, some combination of those things, I, I think, brings people to my plays. And, and I think it also helps to have several plays to choose from. So if you like one, you may find another one you like in my canon. And that's, that's pretty, pretty rad. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, again, I write the stuff I want to see. I want to walk out of the theater feeling empowered and imbued with new knowledge and new wisdom and I mean I really treat theater as my church in many ways so I go for those lessons in morality and in um, community and hope and purpose and all of that and you know not every play has the same version of uh, that hope hard hope um, but there is some some complementarity to it in in all of my 
my plays. I don't really do a kind of creepy, violent play. I don't do- <laughs> No, I'm not familiar with that, uh, that play in your canon. That's you much. <laughs> Partly because, and I, I certainly respect writers who, who do that, and I am so glad that they do that, because I do not do that. <laughs> It takes all kinds, for sure. It does, it does, it does. Something. One of the things I, uh, in answering the question, uh, that I've always loved about your work is, and, and I was reminded of this, I was doing a little preparatory reading for this conversation, and uh, a lot of your plays do have this um, sort of unabashed depth of emotion and inviting people to feel, which I think is not a kind of a common thing in any of our uh, cultural art forms, uh, in this country these days, that kind of permission to to just unashamedly feel something, uh, you know, even if it's this is theater. You're supposed I to feel things. You're supposed to put all the feelings on all the stages. I know. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I <laughs> I I love that. That's why I go to the theater is to watch people just put it all out there. I want to see hearts ripped out on the floor and then I want to see somebody grab it, stick it back in and get it beating again. I want to see resilience. I want to see compassion. I want to see people just driven to their extremes emotionally. I think that is literally the point of dramatic uh, storytelling and live storytelling. Um, and so it, it is, it's baffling to me when I kind of go to the theater and like, did anyone have a feeling in that play? Was there? Or, or did there they deliberately feeling? try and stop me from having a feeling? At, right. That's some point no, 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 no feelings. I'll That's right. Them. That's enough. You've reached um, the maximum feeling limit. So it, yeah, and it's funny because we certainly get that with musical theater. That's the whole point, right? They have so much feeling they got to sing about it. And, <laughs> but why do, that exists in real life. I mean, this is the thing where. Um, real life is more as we are in the middle of this now we are seeing people put up against the worst and showing us their best, showing us their depth of feeling, watching these doctors not being able to hug their children so that they can go back to work to save us. If that isn't a depth of feeling, I don't know what the hell it is. So it's not like this is strange. You know, we are, human beings are prepared for this. We know this. And in fact, that's what I think theater is. It's a thought experiment so that we go to the theater and see how people manage that kind of stuff so that we can learn, so that when it's our turn to hit the wall of crisis or betrayal or heartbreak or whatever, we have some experience because we saw a play about it. And so anyway, right. I'm all about put that, put the emotion in the place. Let people feel it. It's also great for actors. Actors love that crap. Oh, tell me about it. You gotta, feel, gotta feel. Rain them in. <laughs> no, but that's one of the things I love about your plays and I think our audiences have is that um, and, 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 and at the same time, they're not melodramatic. They don't, they don't live in a world of, of excessive emotion or arbitrary I emotion I because do. they're also full of, like you, like you were saying earlier, they're full of learning, they're full of information, they're full of history and science and things that you, you didn't know. So you're, you're feeding your brain and your heart at the same time. And I think that that's a, a really magical combination. So that's my mm -hmm. answer about why so people, right? I will you can use that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, the 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 majority of, of all these productions, I think if I remember correctly from what I was reading, you had 33 productions around the country or something like that last year. The majority of these have been at regional theaters around the country. Theaters like ours, big theaters like the Denver Center here locally, uh, premiered your play Book of Will and uh, other you know major theater institutions around the country. But New York seems to have been kind of a tough not to crack for you. What do you, to what do you attribute being so popular and so successful in so many places, except there? Well, I mean, it's a complex answer. And again, I don't know if I have the right answer for it being on this side of it, but I think it's a couple of things. I love New York. I love New York theater. I love going there. I see a billion plays as soon as I set foot there, as many as I can fit into a day logically. And, um, <clears throat> But I also think there's a lot of playwrights in New York, so they don't actually need anybody who's not, it's not from New York. They're like, yeah, we're, we're actually good. We're full of playwrights, actually. We have plenty here, but thank you so much. <laughs> um, and it's also a lot of the plays that I tend to write and find most fascinating are ones that you don't actually see there very much. There's not as much of an appetite for, say, history plays. So Silent Sky or Ada and the Engine or The Revolutionist, you can do history in musicals and sometimes big Tom Stoppard, you know, Lincoln Center 
his, uh, his, his plays, of course, but you don't see it a lot uh, otherwise. Um, Doll's House being kind of an exception, but it's a, it's a literary thing. And so anyway, a lot of my kind of time travel plays don't seem to have a natural home there. And that's a, a large majority of my work. You don't see a ton of farces that aren't musicals. Um, and so like The Revolutionist or Exit Pursued by a Bear, a couple heightened kind of silly place even though they get very real and, and authentic and, and serious um that doesn't quite have a place uh, either so i don't know um maybe i just haven't found my people i warned you that my cat loves his own music so who's this this is mitten she really just loves a webcam more than oh yeah well, we have a gray cat as we have a large gray cat as well so oh, she's our little the queen of the house yeah. so yeah and then um i don't know i don't know i mean i had an incredible experience with uh the half life of marie curie last year that was off broadway at audible's new theater um and i thought that production was extraordinary the the directing the acting the design, I mean, we just, it was amazing. So I, I'm so thrilled about that. And what's cool about that one is of course, it's available um, as an audio play on Audible as well. So you can listen to that exact performance. Of course, you don't get the great design work by Rachel Halk and the, the costumes and lighting, um, but you get the performances in a really interesting way. So I was really excited to be proud of that project, which that lived in New York. And I am incredibly pleased with how that, how that turned out. Do you think it's partly a, and to, don't, don't say anything that's going to get you in trouble here, do you think it's partly a, a lack of imagination in the commercial theater in that, you know, and, and I think this has been a, an industry-wide issue for some time of there, there's, there's a lack of imagination in the things that we think are commercially bankable, which is why you see the 17th you know, remount of a certain play or this musical <laughs> back because it was gone for five years. So it must be its yeah. turn again, or this Shakespeare vehicle for some famous person. You know, we certainly have that rolling trend. Um, and obviously there's a lot of money at stake. So the people who are putting up these productions are trying to minimize their risk. But, but do you think part of that is just a lack of imagination of what can appeal to people that Maybe. Um, I mean, I will say, I think probably the bigger New York uh, opportunities for me are going to come with some of the musicals that I'm writing, um, which I've been writing a lot lately. I kind of have not really fallen into it. it. It makes total sense, as I just mentioned, how much I love writing big emotion and big characters that are driven to these great heights and depths. And that's perfect for musical theater. So I have a musical called Jeanette and an adaptation of a novel um, that's aiming for the West End, and another one that's, they're all, some of them I can speak about, sometimes I, I can't yet, so I'm not trying to be annoying. Totally. Me. I'm just trying to not get anyone mad at me. Um, and so, you know, but these are big projects, and um, that big projects means big spectacle, means you can get big money to put it on, and big stars, and so that's, that makes a lot of sense. But, um, I don't know, I think maybe this whole disruption might be good for new strange little plays and um, I don't know, New York is a very unique market and the power of the New York Times Review, the power of the, the risk that you go through to put on any play there, the money, it is unique in, in uh, America and so uh, it is no wonder that it's its own um, market, its own sphere, its own ecosystem. Um, yeah. And I don't, I, I can't say that I know exactly how it works, but um, <laughs> I'm grateful for all the theater I get to see and <laughs> I'm not sure anybody fully knows how it works. Okay. I don't know, but I'm excited to bring stuff there because I, what I do love about New York theater is I love bigness. I want to go see those Broadway shows, even if I don't love the show or something, I just still walk away being like, I saw some damn theaters and I, I did, I saw it. I, I had a theater <laughs> experience, exactly. <laughs> You just, uh, you just did a, an adaptation, if I'm correct, of Peter Pan, correct? Yeah. Which I was really excited to, to read about, and uh, I wish I could see it, uh, obviously. But uh, tell us a little bit about how that came to be and what, what you did with it. Oh, man, that was so much fun. So it was the uh, brainchild of Simon Godwin, who just took over Shakespeare Theatre Company in Washington, D.C., the biggest company there. And he comes from the National Theatre in London, and they have this kind of 
tradition of going into that end of the year holiday time with a big family kind of play. And so he brought that to Shakespeare Theater, which of course had never done a play that would be appropriate for anyone under 12 or 13 in their entire 40 year history. Um, and so he came with the director, Alan Paul, to me with the idea of adapting Peter Pan. Now, um, I, what I do know about Peter Pan, there's a lot to love and a lot that is very complex and quite frankly, inappropriate, racist, sexist, <laughs> um, all the miniists um, of, of this play. And I, I at first turned them down. I was like, I just, I don't, I don't know, because I'm gonna have to change a lot. And they're like, great, that's what we were looking for. <laughs> we want you to change a lot. So everything I pitched to them about, well, we gotta change Wendy and we certainly have to change Tiger Lily and we'll probably keep Tinkerbell because everyone likes her like snippy, sassy. Um, but I'm also going to change Peter and they're like, okay, 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 great, great, great. So what, you know, became very important for me in terms of aligning sociopolitical realities now and um, making sure that Tiger Lily, we honor the fact of how damaging that play and the stereotype of Tiger Lily and her people, how damaging that play has been to the indigenous community. And I worked with, um, several indigenous consultants and our incredible actor, Isabella Star LeBlanc, um, to develop this character that had agency and empowerment and was able to use the word like colonialism and you know, call out this, um, the, the badness of it. And of course that play was written by a British writer who I don't even know if he'd ever been to America and yet he's borrowing this indigenous American stereotype, um, twisting it, making it just, oh. So anyway, but that was a great joy to do that. We turned Wendy into a little scientist who loves the stars. So of course, when this crazy boy comes in her room and is like, second star of the ride, straight on to morning, she's like, you had me at hello. <laughs> I will follow you to the stars because I'm a big fan of stars, take me there. But uh, of course, one of the big things we changed is, is she doesn't follow him because she has a crush on him. She follows him because she wants her own adventure. She wants to see those stars. She's got this explorer, investigator, scientist heart. Um, and of course, I realized that right around the time that this was written and first performed was when Marie Curie won her first Nobel Prize. So, and just, man, she was all about this conversation. She loves theater, she loves Colorado. Um, yeah, so it, it, it kind of fit in a strange way. So I was just delighted. But I will say the thing that I changed the most and had the most fun was I have two little boys. And so what is a, what is a way to keep Peter Pan, the fun, the swashbuckling, the thrill of, of that story? but also honor the fact that it's written about a boy who doesn't change. He doesn't feel, he doesn't connect with anybody, he doesn't take responsibility for anyone, he just likes to boss people around and solve things with violence. And I'm going, that is not what we need right now in this world, no to that. So what do we do? Well, we give him what the original play didn't, which was an arc. He changes, he starts out that way and then listens to mainly the women around him and they work together to defeat the great Captain Hook. And, uh, um, and so now we have a story of a boy who is capable of being strong and fun and puckish and sly, but also who learns and who is able to say, I'm sorry, and um, I get it, and please help me. So I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about that one. I love that I love one. That. I hope that one has a, a long life. Well, I hope that uh, our generation of children will grow up with that version of Peter Pan instead of the one that you and I grew up with, maybe. Yeah, oof, oof. Uh, finally, I, I just want to ask you a, kind of a, a personal family question about the, the moment that we're all living through. Um, you're a, obviously a big science fan. A lot of your, your plays deal with different uh, facets of the scientific world. And your husband is a virologist, I believe. Um, so I'm imagining you are, have a, a very unique uh, sort of insight and perspective to what's happening and, and, and the realities of, of this situation. What's that been like, kind of living with someone who, who really understands this at a level that most of us don't, and, and also having a, uh, a scientific background and mind of your own that, that processes it? it I, I imagine your, your perspective is quite different. Um, yeah, I think the main difference was, we were talking about this before a lot of people were, um, he definitely, his virologist spidey sense was firing <laughs> um, early on. Um, and I, because he was talking about it and thinking about it, I was thinking about it as a theater person. So I think um, I, I was one of the first people to, to tweet, I mean, t Twitter, but you know, I um, was the first person to kind of go, uh, 
we need a plan in case this gets serious and we have to cancel shows. And here we are with entire seasons canceled. And so I think it allowed me to immediately jump to, well, how does this affect theater? Now, of course, my heart is most present for those people losing family members, losing their lives, and all the incredible medical workers and service workers and city workers that are keeping us all afloat. Um, but my true love is, is theater. And what I love about theater is its ability to bring people together in real time and space, to feel a story together, hear each other's laughter, and sit right next to each other. And you can't do any of those things now. So it, it, it certainly makes me uh, value all of that in, in an incredibly poignant way now that we don't have it for the moment. Um, but yes, I feel uh, Nathan is, is a bit of a Darwinian kind of thinker, meaning he, he's a theoretical biologist in many ways. He likes to posit and wonder. And so um, a lot of our conversations are not specifically medical because he's not a medical doctor, but um, he is, yeah, he helps me think about all the implications beyond just loss of life, the loss of livelihoods, loss of uh, all of the things in our society that depend on people. Um, helping each other, respecting each other, being there for each other. So it's, it's, it's a strange time for all of us, but I, I think our conversations are actually in some ways probably similar to the ones that are happening around dinner tables all over, which is a practical thing. I mean, we're trying to raise two kids and get a little bit of work done ourselves. And uh, yeah, as I said before, stay safe and sane. So the practical kind of always overwhelms <laughs> the, the theoretical at a certain point, but it is, uh, it is a bit comforting. You can certainly read his book, although maybe you don't want to read his book right now because it is it, it, it kind of predicts a little bit about where we are. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, his book, The Viral Storm, is 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 selling quite well these days. <laughs> well, you know, are, you know, not terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He at first kept mocking me for not writing a virus play. Um, and I was like, yeah, we'll get there. And now I'm like, I don't think anyone wants a virus play now. There's a reason why Shakespeare didn't write a lot of virus plays either. That's true. That's true. Too real. Too real. A little too real. <laughs> too soon, Shakespeare. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me. As I said, we at Betsy are big fans of yours. And our audience uh, are also uh, totally in love with your work and, and so happy that uh, we've been able to bring it to them. I hope we can do it again in the future. And uh, maybe next time you can come visit and hang out. I love it. We'll see you on the other side of all this. All right. Thank you so much, Lauren. Lauren Gunderson, thank you for being with us. And uh, we'll see you soon with another Ghost Light episode. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.